Hi, I'm Tarrant. And I'm Stella. And this is Meeple University, how to play Luxor. In Luxor, players play the role of teams of adventurers delving into this pyramid at Luxor, attempting to retrieve the treasures within. Players will play cards from their hands to move adventurers forward a number of tiles, collecting tiles once they meet the number of adventurers printed on that treasure. The game ends once two adventurers have made it into the central tomb of the pyramid. Players count up points for all of the treasures and sets of treasures they've collected, as well as points for how deep all of their adventurers have gone into the pyramid, and the player with the most treasure wins. To set up the game, place the board on the table and put all the scoring markers on the zero space. Put the supplemental board next to the main board. All of the scarab tokens, keys and wild treasures sit next to the board. Then, take two of each player's workers and place them at the entrance to the pyramid. On each of these three locations, place one of each player's workers. In the central tomb, place the two sarcophagi. Then set up the cards. All of the cards in the game have the same back, but they have a different colour on this side. Separate all of the tan coloured ones into the main deck, and separate the three yellow coloured decks based on their colour or the number of eyes down the bottom. Shuffle each of these separately and place them in their corresponding spaces face up on the supplemental board. Then shuffle the tan coloured cards and place them in the middle of the main board face down. Each player chooses a colour and takes the corresponding token. This is simply because there's no other pieces that the player holds in his or her colour. Then place all the tiles onto the main board. Take the six pink coloured Osiris tiles, shuffle them up and then place one onto each of these four corresponding spaces. There will be two tiles that you won't use. Take the six Horus tiles, two of which have one eye, two have two, and two have three, and place them onto their corresponding locations. You should increase the number of eyes as you go deeper into the tomb. The rest of the spaces on the board are filled with the 30 treasure tiles, which are placed in a random order. You should be left with these tiles with the animals on the back. Separate them by animal and shuffle them up. You should have four snakes, six birds, and four lions, and you'll place these next to the board. Choose a starting player, and then deal each player five cards from this pack. That forms the player's starting hand. You're now ready to play. Each player's turn takes place as follows. The player plays a card from his or her hand and then moves one adventurer exactly the number of spaces shown on that card. Then the player, if possible, activates the location that that worker landed on. Then the player draws a new card back up to five. Play then passes to the next player and moves clockwise around the table until the end of the game. There is a key, unique feature of this game which players must keep in mind when taking these actions, and that is the way the player manages his or her hand. The player may never rearrange the cards in his or her hand. And the player is limited only to playing one of the outer two cards on his or her turn. So, as the board lies right now, this player could only play the two or the plus or minus one. Once the player has played it, the new card which is gained during that turn must be placed into the centre of the player's hand. And therefore, as a player gains cards, they'll go into the centre and slowly migrate towards the outside where the player can use them. 
and getting the cards where you want them in your hand is a key part of the strategy and planning for this game. So let's look again at the specifics of movement. When a player plays a card which has a single number on it, that player must move one of his or her active workers exactly that many tiles deeper into the tomb. Workers that are located on these spaces are not yet active workers. A player must activate them later in the game before being able to move them. So, with this card played in this manner, the red player could move this worker, one, two, three, four, to that space, or could move this worker, one, two, three, four, to that space. When a player does move a worker past a group of inactive workers, that is when that player's worker is activated. Although it's activated in this place, it is then returned to the entrance of the tomb. And this becomes available to move on subsequent turns. During the game, tiles will be removed from the spaces, as part of the game is players collecting these treasure tiles. Once a tile is gone, it is no longer counted when a player is moving. So for the blue player to play a 3, he or she could move this worker 1, 2, 3, skipping over the empty space. As the game wears on, most of the early treasures will disappear from the tomb, and so new workers will be able to move quite quickly through the pyramid. There are two other types of movement card in the base deck of the game. This one allows a player to move his or her worker one space forward or one space backward, and this is the only type of card which allows backward movement in the pyramid. The other shows the red die and a player rolls this six-sided die and then must move one worker exactly that number of spaces. The player rolls the die after playing the card, but then chooses the worker after rolling the die. There are some more powerful movement cards available later in the game at the Horus tiles, and these give the players either more flexibility or some additional actions that they can take when they play the card. And we'll come back and talk about how these work later on in the video. Next, we'll talk about the various actions that can be done on these tiles. After your worker has finished moving, you may take the action at that tile if you qualify for it. Most of the tiles on the board are treasure tiles, and when you land a worker onto a treasure tile, if you have the number of workers matching this icon shown on the right hand side of the tile, you can take that treasure tile. If you have fewer, then you cannot take the tile and your turn is over. So for the green player, taking that movement allows no further action. But taking a subsequent movement to put a second worker onto this tile allows the player to take this tile. The player should then immediately score the victory points printed on the tile, in this case three, moving up the track around the outside. The player still keeps the tile in his or her collection. Note that the points you score are the points on the tile, not the points on the wall. If the tile that you remove from the board has nothing underneath it, then simply leave that space empty. If the tile that you remove has a picture of an animal underneath it, and you'll be able to see that coming from the icons on the wall, then take the top tile from the corresponding temple stack and place it underneath your adventurers on that space. Take no further action. This tile now gives a new action which subsequent adventurers which land there can take, and I'll talk about what these are later in the video. When an adventurer ends on a pink Osiris tile, immediately continue moving forward by the number of steps shown on that tile. A player can never end on a pink Osiris tile. Then perform the action of the new tile that you finished on. When an adventurer lands on a Horus tile, the player has the option of either taking the top card from the corresponding pack, that is the pack that has the same number of eyes as the tile that he or she landed on, or taking a key. If the player chooses to take a card, it is placed into the middle of his or her hand as usual, and replaces the normal draw that the player would do from the main pack on that turn. If the player takes a key, it is added to the player's collection of treasures. Keys are worth one victory point at the end of the game, or can be spent to gain access to the central tomb. The player can't get into the central tomb without a key. We'll talk about the specifics of the central tomb in the endgame part of the video. 
Once the final card has been taken from one of these stacks, the only option left for that particular number of eyes is to take a key. Next, we'll talk about the actions on the temple tiles. And remember that these will come out when you take a treasure from a space that shows animal icons, but the adventurers who start there when the tile is placed do not get to take the action. When a player lands on this tile, he or she may take a wild treasure tile into his or her collection. Wild treasures are worth no points on their own, however they can count as any other type of treasure when collecting sets. At the end of the game, a set of a vase, idol and necklace will grant players extra points, and so these wilds allows players to collect more sets. When a player lands on the scarab tile, he or she takes one of the scarab tokens from the supply. These are all worth a random number of victory points between 1 and 4. When a player lands on one of the Favour of Horus tiles, he or she may take the top card from one of the corresponding Horus decks, exactly if he or she had landed on a yellow tile. The final type of temple tile is the tunnel or secret passage. When a player lands on one of these secret passages, he or she immediately moves to the next secret passage that has been opened in the tomb. If there are no secret passages further down the tomb, then there is no action. Secret passages can be an effective way to, for players to move deeper into the tomb quite quickly later on in the game. And that summarises all of the actions that players can take on tiles in the pyramid. There are four different types of more powerful movement tiles that you can gain from the Horus tiles, and I'll go through these now. A card like this gives a player movement flexibility, as playing this will allow the player to move his or her worker any number of spaces between 1 and 5, and there are equivalent ones for between 1 and 3 and 1 and 6. There is also a 1 to die card, which after the player plays, he or she rolls the die and then may move up to that number of spaces with one adventurer. This card allows a player to advance his or her furthest back worker to the location of his or her second furthest back worker. So in the red player's example, it would be from this location to this location. And in this case, claiming the tile. This can be an effective way to get your straggling worker quite deep into the tomb late in the game. These cards allow the player to move all of his or her workers, in this case one space, or in this case two spaces. The player would move every single worker one space deeper into the tomb. Then, however, the player is restricted only to taking a single action on one of the destination tiles. So in this case, the player could take one card from this three-eyed Horus tile, or could claim this tile as treasure. Remember that all actions taken on a tile, including taking bonuses at temple tiles or using the secret passage, count as an action. So a player can only take one of these actions. This can be an effective way from taking tiles out from underneath players who think they have enough workers to claim them. The final type of special movement tile is one that looks like this. It will have a number between 1 and 3 and then the minus worker icon. This allows the player to move one worker three spaces and then claim the treasure tile that he or she lands on with one fewer worker than would normally be needed. So in this case yellow's one worker with this card would be enough to claim this tile. This is another way to snatch a tile out from underneath somebody who thinks they have enough workers to claim it next turn. To advance into the central chamber of the pyramid the player must meet two conditions must play a card which allows him or her to land in the centre exactly, and the player must spend one key. The first adventurer to gain access to the central chamber gains his or her player the five point sarcophagus. And the second adventurer to enter the central chamber gains the three point sarcophagus. Once the second adventurer has entered the central chamber, the end of the game is triggered and both of these adventurers can be from the same player as long as he or she spends a key for each adventurer. Play then continues until all players have had the same number of turns. Then proceed to final scoring. 
To start final scoring, players should already have been tracking the points that are printed on the tiles that they've been collecting. However, if you haven't been tracking this, you can add it up from the tiles you've got and set your starting score from there. Then, go through endgame scoring in these five steps. Firstly, the player gains points for the number of points printed on the wall in all of the final locations of his or her adventurers. So in the case of yellow here, it would be 13 for the centre, 7 points for this worker and 3 points for this worker. However, be warned that all of the Horus tiles are worth 0 points, and so any adventurers who get stranded on these tiles at the end of the game are going to be worth nothing to you. Add up all of these, and then add that to your score. Then, if you collected one of the sarcophagi from the centre of the tomb, take the points for that, in this case 5. If you have any keys left over, each key is worth 1 point. Then, score sets of treasures that you've collected. And remember that a set is an idol, a vase, and a necklace. And any wilds that you've used can be used to fill up sets. So, in this case here, including the wilds, the player has collected two sets and would score that based on this table. In this case, seven points. Finally, flip over all scarabs that have been collected during the game and score points for those. The player with the highest score wins, and in the event of a tie, the player who had the higher value sarcophagus among the tied players wins. If still tied, victory is shared. And that's how to play Luxor. If you'd like to get more of a taste for how the game flows in practice, you can click on the link in the description to check out our one round playthrough for this game. If you have any questions, feedback, comments, if you just want to say hi to us, we'd like to hear from you, please write in the comment sections below. And finally, if you'd like to be among the first to know what's new from Meeple University, please consider subscribing to our channel by clicking on the Meeple in the corner. Helping us to monetize this channel will help us to bring better content and higher quality content back to you.